Hello, everybody, and welcome to the April edition of Let's Talk. Today's episode is going to be a bit on the meaty side. Okay, really on the meaty side, because I have a lot of things to go over on top of the usual stuff. This is also kind of a special episode, as I want to address the channel anniversary at some point in this video. I also have another video planned for that later in the month, but we'll talk about that later. Uh, and on top of everything else, I also want to go over the scheduling for the next several months. As we head into the thick of the year, into summer, I want to get settled into some more long-term projects, so I'm gonna talk about those. All things that you can expect in today's video, as usual, I've got timestamps up if you wanna to skip to any of the different subjects that we're gonna talk about. But we're gonna to start today by going over some news that came out between last month and this month. And the biggest one that I can think of obviously comes to us from Sony, who finally unveiled their competitor, for Microsoft's Xbox Game Pass. Now, I've said many times before that I am a huge advocate of Game Pass. I think it is a wonderful service. I honestly think it's the only thing that is keeping Xbox alive these days because a lot of their first-party offerings aren't really cutting it anymore. I don't think that their console is all that great, but Game Pass itself is killing it. It is an amazing service, and it is the reason, in my opinion, to get yourself an Xbox. That being said, as is the case in capitalism, when somebody has a really good idea and they're able to just run rampant with it unchecked with no competition, they tend to get arrogant and take things a little bit too far. And I would not put that past Microsoft too in, let's say, like five years. Oh, I don't know, double the price of Game Pass. And we really needed some competition to kind of keep them in check. And I can tell you one thing, it ain't Nintendo Switch Online. They are nowhere close to Game Pass in terms of quality not even close and the only two companies that really could unveil something or anything at all that would come anywhere close to this is well sony and then maybe valve i i would say but that's really it no AAA publisher was going to possibly come out with a competitor that was anywhere near xbox game pass electronic arts ubisoft if they released their entire back catalog onto a streaming service and there are subscription service and just released it at the same price as game pass there is nobody in the world who would buy that over Game Pass, I can promise you that. They just don't have the quality that Game Pass produces. So it was up to Sony or Valve to take the reins. Valve is more interested in its Steam Deck at the moment, which I totally understand because that thing is phenomenal. I cannot wait to get mine. So instead, it was Sony who came out with what used to be known as Project Spartacus, but was eventually just unveiled as a new tier system for the already existing PlayStation Plus. So let's talk about what those tiers offer, and we're going to go over the good, the bad, and the ugly of each of those tiers. The first one really doesn't have anything about it because it's, well, what we already have. PlayStation Plus Essential is the exact same benefits as the current PlayStation Plus. The free monthly games, the exclusive discounts, cloud storage, online multiplayer, all that stuff. Price isn't changing. It's staying exactly as it was. If you decide not to buy into the new tiers, you're just going to be moved over to PlayStation Plus Essential. So nothing to write home about there. Where it starts to get interesting, though, is in tier two, which is PlayStation Plus Extra. So I'm going to be going off of US dollars here. Uh, if you want to look up the European, UK, Japan, Australian pricing, all that stuff, go on to Sony's blog to see your uh, monetary equivalent. But I'm going to go off US pricing, which for PlayStation Plus Essential is 10 bucks a month, 25 bucks quarterly, and 60 bucks yearly. For PlayStation Plus Extra, the second tier, it's going to jump up to $15 a month, $40 quarterly, and $100 a year. So the benefits of PlayStation Plus Extra are... Everything that the Essential tier offers on top of a catalog of up to 400 PS4 and PS5 games from both PlayStation Studios and third-party partners. And the games in this tier are all available to, for download. You do not have to stream these. Every single one of these can be downloaded to your hard drive as long as you have the subscription active and you can just play them that way, just like Game Pass. That being said, we do not know what games are in this catalog. In fact, the only thing that we are absolutely sure of is the fact that PlayStation first party games will not be available at launch in this tier. And this right here is a big deal breaker for a lot of people. I would say myself included, except this whole tier is kind of uninteresting to me for other reasons, but we'll talk about those a little bit later. Um, all in all, a lot of people are very disappointed that PlayStation is not going to be releasing things like Horizon Forbidden West at launch. The God of War sequel is not going to be available on day one in this tier at launch. 
that right there has already kind of set people off. And I sort of understand because, well, Game Pass offers that. That's a big reason people get Game Pass. Is so they can play Halo the day it comes out. So they can play Forza the day it comes out. Whatever upcoming Fable game is going to be available day one. Everything that Microsoft puts out, as well as a lot of indie games that they have gotten partnerships with, are available the day they come out. And Sony is not doing that, which is a deal breaker for many, many people. The one argument that I think people make is whether or not you consider the quality of Sony or Microsoft games to be superior. And in that regard, it's like, well, I I think it's okay with God of War because that game is way better than anything that Microsoft makes. And it's like, yeah, sure, you can make that argument. But at the same time, it's like, this, it's, it's kind of a defining feature of Game Pass. It's one of the biggest reasons why the service is so well loved. I think it's how they're getting so such active communities in their already successful games. I think it's why Halo Infinite was such a mega smash hit at launch despite being kind of a terrible game, at least in terms of Halo. <laughs> as far as Halo is concerned, it's kind of terrible. And I mean, it's a huge advantage that Game Pass has. And if Sony isn't going to try to take advantage of that, that honestly might hurt them in the long run or even in the short term as regards to upgrading this and of course like we said it 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 all depends on what the catalog of 400 games is me personally i have over 300 digital playstation 4 games and another like 60 physical playstation 4 games there's a very high possibility that like 80 or 90 percent of all of the games in this catalog i've already got them and if that's the case, why would I upgrade to this? I have no need to. I mean, granted, I know I'm an outlier. I know not as many people have these gigantic collections like I do. But between gathering all of the PlayStation Plus games over the years and constantly looking at sales, like I rarely buy games at full price. I just jump on discounts a lot. I grab up every free game I can get. And I've been doing that ever since PlayStation Plus was effectively a thing. I'm very diligent about that. And in that regard... I mean, that's a, what's amounted to probably, I would say, two-thirds of that entire collection that I just said there. It's so many games that I have been able to just hoover up at relatively no cost, and there's a good chance a lot of those games will be included in this catalog. We obviously don't know what it is, but if they're going to try to go for this, like, Essentials collection, these PS4 and PS5 games you must play... That's probably going to end up being a lot of the games that have already been given out for free or a lot of the mainstays a lot of people already have. A lot of the stuff that's already included in the PlayStation Plus Essentials Collection right now when you purchase a PlayStation 5. I mean, these are things that a lot of people could already have access to and it's up to them to prove whether or not it's actually worth getting because... An extra five bucks a month might not seem like a lot immediately in the short term, but in the long term, that's a huge bump. That's an extra 60 bucks a year. And if you're going for the yearly fee, that's still a $40 price increase. $100 coming out of your paycheck, especially for the large majority of us who are living paycheck to paycheck, 100 bucks coming out at any one time, that's a big ask of people. And I feel like PlayStation Plus Extra has a very high chance of not delivering at the level that people want it to. But where things I think get even more interesting is with PlayStation Plus Premium, the final tier. Now this jumps up to $18 a month, $50 quarterly, and $120 yearly. Okay, it's already a big ask. This includes all the benefits from both the essential and extra tiers on top of 340 additional games. This has an asterisk on it. I'm just going to read what they wrote here. PlayStation 3 games available via cloud streaming. A catalog of classic games available in both streaming and download options from the original PlayStation, PS2, and PSP generations. Conveniently, no Vita in there. Poor Vita. Uh, it also offers cloud streaming access for original PlayStation, PS2, PSP, and PS4 games offered in the extra and premium tiers markets. Essentially, PlayStation Now is just grandfathered into this whole thing and there's also time limited game trials which will also be offered in this tier so customers can try select games before they buy okay let's address each of these bullet points before we get any further first things first playstation 3 games available via cloud streaming write that off instantly that is not compelling to me in the slightest cloud streaming does not work a lot of people do not have the internet for this myself included and probably never will this never works it's the most inferior way to play a game even when it does work and you just can't sell me on that you can't so write that off right off the playstation now inclusion i don't care 
However, the classic PS1, PS2, and PSP games is interesting, especially the PSP games, because we've never really had those as uh, a, or had those available on home consoles before. That's completely new. And the PSP had a lot of good games on it, so I am interested at least to see what those are. Now, these are available for download, so that's good. The PS1 and PS2 games I'm a bit more skeptical on, because if I'm being honest... I'm willing to bet that this is just all of the PS1 and PS2 classics that were already available on the PS3 and PS4, probably without any future additions. I bet that's just it. Now, that being said, a lot of those PS1 and PS2 classics are good, especially the PS1 classics. You, for the most part, get access to all, almost all of the best PS1 games through that route. The PS2 catalog leaves a little bit more to be desired but there are some gems in there for sure there's also some weirdos and some stinkers i mean good example i'm currently doing a playthrough of tulip plan to get back to that soon and uh that game i'm actually playing through the playstation 3 via its ps2 classics edition wouldn't be surprised if that game is included in this list of classic games alongside again all of the other classics so it, it won't surprise me if those are just straight ports of those previous editions that they had already created for the PS3, PS4, the PlayStation Portable, the PlayStation Vita, etc. So that might not be compelling to people, but if you've ever wanted to go back to those classics, it is a good way of playing them. I think that that is okay. Is it an extra eight bucks a month? Okay, I don't know about that, but let's continue. Time-limited game trials. All right, so this was instantly written off by people as just demos, which is if that's the case, like if it's the game demos that we already have available to us, that's not a selling point, guys. However, this is something that I think a lot of people have forgotten about, but back during the early days of PlayStation Plus, one of the benefits it had, you know, before the days of uh, paid-for online gaming, back when PlayStation Plus was just kind of this little bonus subscription you could pay for, uh, one of its features was these time-limited game trials, and what these were were an ability to download the entire game and you had access to the full thing for a set amount of hours. I think it was either one or two hours that you could play the game and as soon as that ran out, then the demo ended. It wasn't like a curated, okay, you only get to experience these three or four levels or whatever and then your demo's done. It wasn't like that. It was you play as much as you can squeeze into this time frame, then it cuts you off once the time is up. However, if you then decide to buy the game, you can pick up where you left off. That's how it works, which I think that's a better way to experience a demo. And if that's the type of demos they're bringing back, that I, th I think you can safely say that that is a selling point and it has some merit to it. But it's definitely not a reason to upgrade for eight extra bucks. Absolutely not. I just think that people are too quick to write this off as just regular game demos. It might not be. But obviously that remains to be seen. There's still a lot we don't know about this service uh, or a lot of details and a lot of the nitty gritty, a lot of the stuff that people are actually willing to stump up cash for. And in that regard, I am very skeptical, but obviously this is only a couple of months away. So I'm sure we're going to get a lot of information about this over the next several weeks uh, because who knows? Maybe it will actually surprise us in the end. Yeah, it's going to miss some selling points and whatnot, but Sony wants to compete with Microsoft here. They want to. They have to. They're trying to. They can't just leave Game Pass untouched or someday it is going to take over the market. And, well, I mean, remember when Netflix was in charge of everything and they accrued so much cash that they were able to then open up all of their own movie studios because they were just that big of a juggernaut? If Sony leaves this for too long, Microsoft will be. I mean, and they technically kind of are already that. I mean, look at how much capital they have to swing around. All these studios they've been just straight out buying, including Bethesda and Activision. Microsoft can kind of do whatever it wants from a monetary standpoint. But it, if it also corners the game subscription market, that's really bad for Sony. They need to compete. And they might just be kind of wading into the shallows right now, not ready to dive headfirst into the, into the competition just yet. But who knows? We have to see because Sony is also very patently arrogant with their decision making. We've seen this time and time again. They got arrogant with the PS3. They got arrogant towards the back half of the PS4 uh, generation. They do this all the time. Whenever they feel like they're in a spot where they can comfortably say, yes, we're winning, they get complacent and they can't afford to do that because Microsoft is making moves. They are starting to take over a lot more of the market. They're grabbing market share left and right, and Sony needs to be able to stay in this market because 
let's be honest, out of all of the big video game manufacturers, they're actually the weakest. Not from a quality standpoint, but from a monetary standpoint, from a profit standpoint, from a capital standpoint. Sony has the smallest dick to swing around versus something like a Steam, a Valve, or a Nintendo, or a Microsoft. They don't have as much power, and they need to check themselves before they end up destroying themselves. Okay, let's move on from that. The next topic I actually want to get into is a little bit of an interesting one, um, something that I've been that's been on my mind for a little while. This is more of a personal thing. It's kind of to do with news, but also at the same time, not really. It's just it's this whole thing. So I want to talk about game collecting for a minute because I don't talk about this very much, but over the last couple of years, I've had a... Game collecting has been a bit of a sore spot for me over the past couple of years. I used to be an incredibly avid video game collector. I had a physical collection of well over a thousand games dating all the way back to the NES. And I still do have a fair bit of few physical games, but in the past couple of years, I have actually sold off a large chunk of my collection. Now, that's not to say I've lost access to those games. Absolutely not. I have gone into the extensive process of homebrewing my consoles, backing up my games, saving all of the files on hard drives, and I can still play them, absolutely, but the actual physical aspect, the discs themselves, those are gone. I have knocked my GameCube and Wii collection, which combined was around about 400 games. I've knocked that down to about 20 now. PlayStation 2 collection knocked that down from about 200 to, I think, 15. Um, and there are also a couple of other ones that I've knocked down as well. Essentially, game collecting has lost a lot of its luster for me, and I kind of don't want any part of it anymore for a myriad of reasons. One of the big ones is obviously the state of the economy lately and how it's affected everything and game collecting is no exception prices for games have jumped up significantly for the past couple of years if you've been paying attention in any way retro games are so hard to come by and especially certain console markets like the gamecube and the nintendo 64 have just exploded and it's getting so prohibitive and so hostile to the point where it's causing a lot of problems and i have decided effectively i want nothing to do with it anymore it's just too much to deal with but I wanted to kind of discuss a couple of perpetrators in this regard and just I guess I guess I'm just sort of ranting by saying this but I'm also you know expressing frustrations because I, I want to know if anyone else feels the same way that I do it's it's a little bit disheartening these days when you've got certain organizations like oh I don't know WADA out there creating this artificial grading system trying to piggyback off of other uh uh, other hobbies like coin collecting and trading card collecting that do have long-standing, long-running grading systems and trying to add that into games where it's so superfluous and it's so pointless and using it to artificially inflate this market. And they're doing it in such a disingenuous way, too. I mean, these guys, these guys behind this. So if you don't know what WADA is, so you don't know what grading is in general. And I guess I'll just start from a point of a personal standpoint. As a kid, I used to collect... Uh, baseball cards a lot, like very heavily. I also collected football, basketball cards, Pokemon cards, things like that, but baseball was my mainstay. I had a massive baseball card collection, still do in fact, it's just all tucked away in storage, of over, I want to say about 50,000 baseball cards. I got this huge collection and I was so into it. And I actually have a fair bit of very valuable cards and I remember that grading was a huge part of the whole value proposition of baseball cards because it's one thing to get a card it's another thing to not only keep it in good condition but to then get it graded and sealed in that condition to dramatically increase its value this is obviously important because baseball cards are cardboard they're super easy to ding and dent and bump and uh, bend the edges of and fray and just damage in so many different ways to face and it is so easy to do that that if you can find a card that is comp um, basically untouched the worst it's got is a, maybe a fingerprint or two those sorts of cards are extremely hard to find they are what we would call pristine the highest level of quality of a card and being able to get a card verified in that condition dramatically increases its value, again, because it has been preserved, which is huge for collecting in general. A good example of this is I have a baseball card 
and I'll, I'll, I'll just kind of give a layman's explanation of this, but I have a baseball card of a player that used to play all the way back in the 1950s and 60s whose name is Mickey Mantle. He played for the New York Yankees, and he had a commemorative card that was made in 1961 uh, for hitting a home run that went like, the farthest a home run had ever gone at the time. It was like 565 feet or something like that. And this card is, its a, I mean, it's an antique. It's a card from 1961. And I found this at an antique store for like a dollar. All right. But the thing about it is that this card, the one that I have, had, its edges are practically rounded. So therefore, it's not in very good condition. But even still, even in that state, it's still worth like 60, 70 bucks online. That same card, were I to get it in pristine condition, would suddenly jump up to well over $400, okay? That's a huge increase. And this is not the only card in my collection that's actually that, that could potentially jump up that much if I had kept it in pristine condition, but that's just a good example. Very old card, commemorative card, card that's already worth a lot even in bad condition, but can be significantly increased in value by having it in perfect condition, okay? It makes sense for cards because, like I said, they are easily damaged. They're easily destroyed. They're easily defaced. Video games are not. Video games are pieces of media that play on a device and it either plays or it doesn't. Yes, you do want things like the box to be intact. Yes, you do want things like the manual to be intact. But beyond that, that's all you care about. It's a plastic box. You're not super worried about it being destroyed unless, oh, I don't know, you're like throwing it against the wall or stepping on it and cracking it and things like that. And even then, that doesn't affect the integrity of the game. There are three levels to game collecting, okay? Three. There is loose, partially complete, and fully complete, or what we know as complete in box. Either you have it as just the disc, which is the cheapest way to have the game. You have it with just the disc and the case or just the disc in the manual, but the former is way more common. Or you have it complete in box, which is game, manual, and case, all three. That's it. That's the end of it. Complete in box is the most valuable form or most valuable state a game can be in. At that point, you can't go any better. However, there is a certain group of people, and I will not go into the particulars on this group, but there is a nice video from a YouTuber named Carl Jobst who goes into in depth on this particular group in a video he made called Exposing Fraud and Deception in the Retro Video Game Market. This video came out uh, a little bit last year. It's got 1.5 million views. He's also got a follow-up video called The Retro Video Game Scam Gets Worse, but the first video is one I would highly re recommend checking out. There is a group of people who are... You, you would call them investors. They're people who are already very wealthy, but they don't like to play the market very fairly. They like to go into niche markets and try to artificially inflate those markets so that they can make a quick buck and get out. They tried to do this with the coin collecting market back in the 80s. They got a lot of people in on this scam, a lot of people to believe that this market was going to explode. And they got them to believe this by dumping their own money into the market to inflate the value of the coins, prompting everybody to then buy while it was still low and seemingly going up and then they quickly scammed everybody by jumping out and and taking the value again it's essentially a pump and dump scheme these are very common and very illegal and the ftc has gotten on these guys's asses multiple times in the past but guess what they're at it again and they're using the video game market this time if you want evidence of this you might recall that there was an article that came out I don't remember exactly how long ago but it was within the last year and it was talking about how a complete inbox copy of Super Mario 64 sold for over a million dollars on eBay. And this would immediately raise red flags if you knew anything about the game collecting market because complete inbox Super Mario 64 copies usually go for about $131. If they're brand new, sealed, which is what this game actually was, if they're brand new and sealed, they certainly don't go for a million dollars. They go for about six grand. That's a lot of money, but it sure as heck ain't a million dollars. It's missing a few digits there. So if you saw that and you didn't immediately think, oh, that's so clearly money laundering, then you don't know how economics work. So this was clearly raising a lot of red flags, but these guys have gone on to found or at least partner with a bunch of people to make the Wata Grading Group, which is a company that is made specifically to grade video games. And while yes, it is absolutely technically true 
that grading systems are in and of themselves arbitrary. These organizations, these entities, usually are founded on a basis of trust and usually around a group of very reputable collectors. These are not just a bunch of nobodies who come in and decide this is how much your game is worth. These are people that have been in the game for a very long time and they know what they're talking about. With WADA, that is not the case. These are guys that have come in specifically just to inflate the value of video games for no other reason than to make themselves richer. They have accrued this massive collection of games. In fact, they've actually partnered with one of the most premier collectors in all of video gaming and used his entire collection to, well, effectively get each other all richer than they already are by again inflating this market so that once they get it to a certain point they can sell and they can screw the rest of us over and you might think okay well this is obviously a problem but is it really that big of a deal when it comes to game collecting yes because if you've been paying attention to where the numbers are going things are going up like crazy and it's beyond the norm it's not just with inflation it's going up all over the place in so many various areas and it's also affecting a lot of mom and pop stores it's affecting a lot of your local retro video game stores these stores are seeing where these average sale prices are at and they're pricing their own offerings accordingly. It's screwing all of us. But on top of that, and while I'm mentioning the Ma and Pa stores, a lot of the people that are getting into that business these days as well, not the people who have been around a while, but a lot of people that are opening up these new retro game stores are kind of just as scummy. If you've been paying attention, again, a lot of these stores are starting to open in places that Honestly, before, a retro owning a retro game store was kind of a passion project. You had to go into it knowing you were going to lose money, but most of these people ran it because they love video games. They love these collections. They love being in that environment, and most of those stores are starting to go the way of the Dodo, but these new stores are trying to, again, capitalize on the market. They're becoming more sleazy. They're making it harder for us to purchase these games, and well, yeah, they're still small time they still have ulterior motives. They're still making it harder for the rest of us. And, you know, I, in a way, I'm definitely overstating things in, you know, certain ways. It's not like the most prohibitive thing ever. You can absolutely still bolster your collection and try to get into the hobby these days, but it's getting worse. And that's the problem. I'm not seeing this getting better anytime soon. And at the moment, it's getting so bad and it feels so slimy that I just I cannot obtain any joy from it anymore. I want no part of it. And I love collecting things. I absolutely do. My latest vice is Pokemon cards because it's pretty much, as bad as Pokemon cards are, it actually feels like the least prohibitive market at the moment. It feels like something that I genuinely enjoy that I can actually participate in. Video game collecting doesn't feel that way to me anymore. Now it's just about ownership. It's just about having these games. It's about growing my access, but not necessarily my collection, if that makes sense. I have hard drives absolutely chock full of games. I have consoles jam-packed with additional memory to hold more. I have all of these ROMs and these ISOs that I've dumped off of my cartridges and discs backed up onto hard drives so I can access them later. I mean, it's it sucks that this is all I live for in terms of game collecting these days, but I just feel like game collecting as a hobby has lost everything. It's not what it used to be anymore, and there's just too many people trying to exploit it for their own gain. It's not fun. It's lost a lot of that, and I do respect people who still manage to keep going and are still as enthusiastic as ever about it but I, I don't know man it's it's hard these days it really sucks and I really just wish that a lot of these bad actors would get out of it so I could enjoy this hobby again but unfortunately I just don't see that happening anytime soon unless a concerted effort is made to take these bad actors down all right that's enough of that I guess it was a rant but it was something that I still wanted to kind of address Let's move on to the games that I've been playing over the past couple of months. I'm just going to talk about each one of them briefly, but not too much because I've already kind of discussed each one of them to a degree. The first of those is Tunic, which I have only played a couple hours beyond where I left off in the playthrough. The only thing I want to really talk about with that game, because I, I want to know how much people are enjoying it. It's, it's kind of funny because when it first came out, I, there was a lot of enthusiasm surrounding the game. But then it petered out really quickly, and now I don't hear anybody talking about it anymore, and I'm wondering if it's for the same reason that I fell off of the game. And that's the targeting system. I hate the targeting system in that game. It really ruins the combat. It is otherwise such a nice, neat, simple little game, but golly, that targeting system needs some work. It, maybe they've improved it since then, and I just haven't been paying attention, but that one issue really kills the game for me and I was experiencing it already 
in the small three episode playthrough I did, but I just oh that that hurt it so bad. I, I had to just put the game down and move on to something else. Go back to Horizon Forbidden West and Destiny and all that kind of stuff. As well as the next game that I want to talk about, which is Elden Ring. Okay, so Elden Ring has been kind of a hot topic lately, hasn't it? <laughs> I mean, I get it. I get it. People who like From Software games really like From Software games. And Elden Ring is probably, or at least according to a lot of people, the best game that From Software has ever made. Here's the thing. I have a complicated relationship with Souls Likes. Uh, I don't like most of them. There are a couple I like. My absolute favorite out of all of them is Bloodborne. And if I were to pick a second favorite, I would probably go with the first Neo. Neo 2 was great as well, but it was just... Neo 2 was a game I just could not beat flat out. Neo 2 and Sekiro were the two that where the difficulty was so high... I just couldn't do it, or at least I just couldn't get enough of a grasp on the game's mechanics to beat them. Those games were prohibitively hard for me because I'm just, I'm not that good at that sort of combat. Um, third person combat in general just doesn't really tickle my fancy all that much. I'm not huge into sword and shield gameplay. It's why I don't actually like 3D Zelda games all that much. If I'm going to play third person combat, I prefer Spectacle Fighters, the likes of Devil May Cry and Bayonetta. That is more my speed as opposed to the more patient, meandering, wait for the enemy to attack and either dodge or parry. That whole combat system just isn't as much up my alley. I like more fast-paced, constant action, fast, fluid, combo-laden moves. Those, That's what I want in my third-person action. So in that regard, Demon Souls, I mean, I beat it. I liked it to a degree, but that game has not aged very well. I don't ever go back to it. None of the Dark Souls games clicked with me that much. I think if I were to pick between the three, I liked the third game the most. And Elden Ring... So here's the... Th here, I have a positive and a negative about my thoughts on Elden Ring so far. With Elden Ring, I do greatly appreciate how accessible it is. And I know everyone's talked about this at length, but I want to add, add to it just a little bit by saying it's not just the variety in builds and the fluidity with which you can make your characters and the fact that you can technically salvage any build you make regardless of how shot it feels. You can make something out of anything in that game. You're not nearly as restricted in you as you are in other Souls-likes, and I do appreciate it for that reason and that reason alone. But even more than that is level grinding. When I play RPGs, I like to level grind, and it doesn't matter how hard the game is. That's just the way I play games. Even in Pokemon, I grind all the time. I spent, I think, what was it? I think I spent 12 hours straight one day just farming Audino in Pokemon Black and White without progressing whatsoever. For no reason. Absolutely no reason. But that's just the way that I play games. I like taking my time if I'm able to and being rewarded for just hashing it out over and over and over again. I don't mind grinding as long as the gameplay loop is fun or as long as I'm at least distracted doing something else. Like with Pokemon, that's such a mindless game that I can do that while I watch a movie or something like that because I don't have to think about it too much. And I appreciate games that give me that option. Elden Ring actually gives me that option. And granted, every, almost every Souls-like does, but Elden Ring does to a special degree where it actually lets you mix things up and it lets you choose how you want to tackle the challenge and and you don't just have you're not just stuck in one area farming the same enemies going back to a bonfire respawning them and then just going back and taking them out again you can actually find specific areas where it's much easier to farm than others and you can you know pick and choose your battles which i do really like that it allows you to kind of almost tailor the difficulty depending on how much work you're willing to put in my biggest problem with elden ring though is just i'm just sick of them man I, I know I know that's a controversial opinion to have, but I'm just tired of these sorts of games. After Demon Souls and Dark Souls 1 and Dark Souls 2 and Dark Souls 3 and Bloodborne and Neo and the Demon Souls remake and Neo 2 and Sekiro and all these freaking games, The Surge, Lords of the Fallen, I'm just tired of them. I'm so tired of them. I, I'm, I'm, more than anything, I'm tired of the aesthetic. I'm tired of so many of these games if not looking the exact same and having the same art style, at least feeling the exact same. It's another reason why I like Bloodborne so much. Because while, yes, it does have a similar feel, that hopeless, dark, depressing feel that every Souls-like game has, it's the Victorian Gothic setting that really sets it apart. Elden Ring just feels like a slightly prettier version of all of the other Souls games, uh, both not just from a visual standpoint, but also from an artistic standpoint. It is prettier for sure. 
but it still gives me a lot of the same vibes. And I don't know, I'm 12 hours in, maybe I do need to play more and I'll experience better areas, but it, it's starting to get to the point this many games in where I am starting to feel the you've played one, you've played them all feeling of these series. And that's bad. I feel like that right there, I say this is somebody who plays every Pokemon game multiple times over, but for some reason, you know, like I said, this is already a genre that doesn't click with me as much, and once a series gets to that point where I'm just becoming fatigued with the constant repetition, that's usually a death knell for me. It's, it's really bad, and I'm sure that it's just a thing that From Software likes this style, and I know a lot of people are really attracted to the hopelessness and the darkness that you see in these games. But for me, it's getting a bit stale, guys. It's getting a bit tiresome. And Elden Ring is not really hitting those notes with me from an aesthetic standpoint. I know that's, again, it's very controversial to say so, but that's just the way I've been feeling with this game. I've put it down for a little while. I probably will come back to it a little bit later. But right now, yeah, it's just not clicking that much. What game is clicking, though, so much so, in fact, that I actually had to stop it for different reasons, is Kirby and the Forgotten Land, the complete opposite of the Elden Ring spe spectrum. Isn't it kind of hilarious that we have another two games that are paired up in the same month of each other that are just sort of polar opposites. I mean, this happened with Animal Crossing and Doom a few years back, and now it's happening again with uh, Elden Ring and Kirby. And you know what? Just like the last time it happened, I think I'm liking the Nintendo game a lot more. Now, I did actually stop with Kirby and the Forgotten Land once I got a few stages in, well, not a few stages, a few worlds in, excuse me, because I have decided that I want to actually do a playthrough of the game on the channel, so I'm not going to go any further with that. We're just going to leave it as is, jump right back in. I I really like Kirby. I think it's this is one of the best Kirby entries yet. Is it my favorite Kirby game? I don't know about that yet, but gosh, it is a good one. I think people jumped the gun with the style of game that this was supposed to be. Even in the demo, I don't think it gave us the... Well, I guess in hindsight it did, but I still don't think people 100% fully understood the type of game that this was supposed to be. It's essentially Super Mario 3D World, but Kirby, as opposed to a 2D outing, which you would compare to like New Super Mario Brothers or something like that, uh, with Return to Dreamland or whatever. It's just straight up like Super Mario 3D World, but again, it's got Kirby mechanics, and I really like that. I think it is super clever and super creative. Kirby in and of itself is already pretty darn clever with a lot of the things that it does, but Forgotten Land just takes the level design and the mechanics to a whole new level beyond anything that Kirby's done before, and I'm, I'm, I'm into it. I think it's a lovely game. Obviously, it's easy, which, you know, that's fine. Every Kirby game is supposed to be but it's just so wonderful, and we're definitely going to be jumping into that game here on the channel in the near future. As always, let me know your thoughts on the games that you've been playing over the last little bit. Tell me about them. If it's the same games I've talked about, feel free to discuss your own opinions, and if it's any games I haven't mentioned, please talk about those as well. As far as games that are coming up that I'm looking forward to, the only one that's on my radar for this month is Pocky and Rocky Reshrined. I will definitely be picking that up as soon as it comes out. I'm extremely excited for it. I've got it on pre-order. It's coming. I, I'm so excited for that game, but aside from that, I'm not really looking forward to a whole lot else, which I suppose is fine based on the way that the channel schedule is about to go, and I am going to talk about that in just a minute. But before we talk about that, a couple of upcoming projects I have on the way that I want you guys to expect that have nothing to do with playthroughs or Let's Plays or any of that stuff. One thing I am going to have this month is going to be an anniversary video. Uh, I mentioned this at the very beginning. We are going to address it. The anniversary is April 26th, so I'm going to try to have the video out by then. I'm going to record it actually the day that this video is going up, so we'll see how that turns out, but I'm going to do something a little bit unorthodox, something I've never really done on the channel before, a little bit of reminiscing, uh, because, you know, 11 years is a long time. And I, I feel like it's a good time to kind of look back on everything that we've accomplished on this channel thus far and just sort of reflect, just kind of go over those things. I don't know exactly what the format is going to be yet. I think I've got a pretty good idea, but I don't want to spoil anything right off the bat. But hopefully that video will be out in time for the 26th. The other sort of project that I want to talk about is top 10 lists or top 20 lists or top 5 lists or 
well, list videos in general. I made a few of these in the past, and I feel like these days with my video format becoming more refined and my style of script writing becoming more refined and my commentary and all that kind of stuff, I feel like these days it would be a good time to kind of jump in and just make a bunch of these. List videos are very simple, very fun to make. They prompt a lot of discussion. I feel like people enjoy them a lot, even if they don't necessarily agree with the opinions they're in. I was thinking about tackling some pretty simple subjects like, oh, I don't know, top 20 Nintendo 64 games or GameCube games or PlayStation 2 games or things like that. Going a little bit more broad with the topics just to kind of get things started, the ball rolling on these sort of videos before I get into the more nitty gritty and the more interesting subjects like, oh, I don't know, the top 10 boss battles or the top 10 video game soundtracks or things of that nature. We'll, we'll start simple, but I, I am going to be working on some of those. I'm actually going to be writing some scripts for those in the coming days, and I'm not going to give you a time frame as to when those are going to come out. They'll just be kind of a whenever thing, but they are something that I am actively working on here in the future. Okay, let's talk about scheduling. So... It's kind of been a crapshoot to start with this year. I've been very good about daily uploads. I don't think I've missed a single day yet thus far, and I'm trying to keep that streak going through the end of the year and possibly into the next year. And uh, it's been a little bit sporadic as to whether or not you guys get one video a day or two. It's been sort of all over the place. The only thing that's been very consistent with my upload schedule thus far has been the days that my Let's Plays go up. Forza has gone up every Tuesday and Saturday. Subnautica has gone up every Wednesday and Sunday. I'm going to try to keep those days set in stone going forward. That's going to be sort of the template for the remainder of the schedule. Because the goal by the end of, let's say, May, is to try to have at least two videos a day every single day. And with four of those, what, 14 uploads being Let's Play uploads, I would like to have a lot of variety installed in there. Uh, as for the long-term series, though, let's talk about each one of those individually. So Subnautica is ending in about a week, and that is going to be very obviously replaced by another Let's Play. What Let's Play that is... I've already told you, it's going to be Horizon Forbidden West. It's a game I've been planning on Let's Playing pretty much from the moment that it was even announced, let alone since it came out. And even after playing through most of the game myself, I'm still pretty set in stone, set in my ways with wanting to Let's Play this game. That being said, it is an absolutely massive game. So massive, in fact, that it is likely going to rival some of my longest Let's Plays ever and definitely proceed well into next year. And then, of course, Forza Horizon 3 is no slouch either. There's several episodes left to that. It's probably going to go for at least a few more months before we can call it quits. And with all of that in place, there's not really room for any other Let's Plays. So we've just got all of the other stuff. And I have a few games that I'm going to be bringing back for more long-term series. And those will be interspersed throughout the week on other days in other time slots. The first of those is going to be Kena Bridge of Spirits. I have been greatly enjoying that game, and I definitely want to see it through to the end. I've already recorded more of it, in fact, and you'll see the fruits of that labor in a few weeks. But we're going to try to keep that one going pretty steady as well. On top of that, I already mentioned before in the episode, Kirby and the Forgotten Land. We'll be bringing that about here in the near future. And then another series that I've already started that is going to be going a little bit longer is Greg Hastings' Tournament Paintball Maxed, the longest title ever. I has said many times during that series that I want to keep that one going through the career mode until we reach the professional tier, which we still have a ways to go before we're there. So expect to see a little bit more of that game. Aside from that, you'll probably also see some more Tulip episodes. Now, obviously, this isn't all going to be happening at the same time, but these are the series that you're going to be seeing a lot of in the future. But the last one that I want to talk about is actually part of a Let's Play that I already completed a few years ago. And it's mostly because I wasn't completely satisfied with how much I covered in that game. And that is, well, of course, Let's Play Fallout 4. If you don't remember, I went into that series completely blind, having never played a Fallout game before. And by the time I was done with the main campaign, I had only just barely gotten a grasp of the entire game's mechanics. I missed out on a lot of faction-related stuff, totally left the Minutemen and the Institute and the Brotherhood of Steel all in the dust. And I would like to explore those faction quests further with smaller, more role-play-focused playthroughs with individual characters. That being said, 
Those series are going to take a little bit of setup, a little bit of route planning. I need to experience very curated, specific things with each of those playthroughs. They're going to be, like I said, shorter, probably no more than 20 to 30 episodes per playthrough, but there's going to be multiples of them, and the first one of those is going to be starting here somewhat soon. So that is also going to be thrown in there. So here is a general idea of what the schedule is supposed to look like by the end of the month of May, just to give you guys all an idea. Now, the first upload of the day is always at the usual time, 4 p.m. Eastern Time, 1 p.m. Pacific. A second upload is usually in the evening, 9 p.m. Eastern Time or 6 p.m. Pacific. Just keep that in mind as I mention each time slot. Okay, Sunday, the first upload would be an episode of Horizon Forbidden West. And the second episode is probably going to be something random, like a one-off or one of the other random Let's Have a Look At series or Games I Remember or any of that kind of stuff. That is going to be saved for the later time slot on Sunday. Monday is going to be an episode of Kena Bridge of Spirits and an episode of Kirby. Tuesday would be an episode of Forza and Fallout. Wednesday would be an episode, again, of Horizon Forbidden West and, what do you know, another empty slot, variety slot, a one-off. Thursday, again, Kena and Kirby. Friday will be a two-episode variety mix. So no Kena, no Kirby, no Fallout, no Forza, no Horizon. It's just going to be two variety episodes on Friday just to mix things up. And then Saturday... Just like Tuesday, it's going to be Forza and Fallout. This is, of course, barring any other side content where some series will be shuffled out of the way to make room for, oh, I don't know, an episode of Let's Talk or possibly a list video or possibly some other thing that I wanted to upload, except for the Let's Plays. Those upload times and days will be non-negotiable every single time. And to preserve both my sanity and yours, I will try to never upload three videos in a single day. I feel like that is just overkill. Two episodes is already pushing it, but I have started to bring down the lengths of my videos in my non-Let's Play related stuff. It's going to get easier to digest these videos as time goes on, I promise, especially if you're also only interested in one or two series. But I want to just put a lot of variety out there. I want to give you guys a lot of options while still keeping the same steady upload schedule that I've always had. So that about covers that. I might do a little bit more with the scheduling, possibly make like a Google document for you guys to be able to check out on a weekly basis to see what you're going to get. I don't actually know yet. I'm also kind of terrible at keeping up with those sorts of things, but I'll see what I can do. Try to add it on top of everything else. I'm trying to make things look a little bit nicer, pretty things up. I've also started doing some other stuff like removing the series titles from my thumbnails and things like that. I'm not talking like removing the game title. I'm talking like the, you know, let's have a look at, you know, I put those in the thumbnails. I'm going to start taking those out of the thumbnails because that's a little unnecessary. I think it's plenty to just leave that in the video title and then retroactively remove it later when it's no longer relevant while still keeping it in the same playlist. I'm trying to just make things look a little bit nicer around here. More organized, more functional, more understandable, you know, all of that good stuff. Okay, let's finally end this episode we got one last thing to talk about and that is of course like every one of these let's talk episodes the series that i am not continuing neither one of these should come to you guys as a surprise if you have been paying attention at all i made it very clear on the final episodes of both of these series that they would not be continuing but i just want to stress why a little bit more here in this episode the first of those is very obviously banjo kazooie nuts and bolts look I get it. I know a lot of people think that that game is fun for what it is. Yes, there's the obvious complaints about it. And, you know, oh, it's bashing on platformers and stuff like that. And it hit a raw nerve for a lot of people back then. Whatever. That's all fine and good. What Banjo-Kazooie Nuts and Bolts is trying to be is, to me, not even fun. I get that a lot of people think that it's, well, it's still good. It's just not a great Banjo-Kazooie game. No, I mean... That's your opinion and all, man, but my opinion is that the game actually legitimately sucks and I don't want to play it anymore. I have never had such an immediate overwhelming impression of I need to stop playing this with such a, I guess, well-known game as Banjo-Kazooie Nuts and Bolts. I was just so quickly turned off by everything that it was aspiring to be and I want nothing to do with it anymore, despite how hilarious it might be to poke fun at that game for a few additional episodes. That one's done. The other one is very obviously Tunic, and again, I made it very clear that that game just does not work 
for my commentary style. I already have a hard enough time trying to play those sorts of games, and I would have really needed to buckle down and focus, which of course takes away from the commentary aspect of the whole thing, making the entire endeavor as a commentated playthrough pointless. So it just was not a good idea for me to try to play that game in that state. But of course, the more I tried to brute force it, even outside of recording, the more I found that I'm actually not even enjoying the game all that much because it has such a bad targeting system. So no regrets about stopping that game. If it still interests you, obviously go check it out for yourself. Don't let me be the one to dissuade you from wanting to play it. But yeah, I, I ain't going back to that game anytime soon. And that's really it. I will also tentatively mention contrast, not saying that I am for sure done with it, but I'm not 100% sure I need to see more of that, at least from a playthrough standpoint. I might just beat that in my own time. I mean, it was interesting. It's a sweet little indie game, and it's honestly very similar to a lot of, not dime a dozen indie games, but a lot of the good indie games from that period, which that's fine and all, but it's like we have so many games to cover on this channel, I don't know if I can spend such an extensive time on every single one of those good indie games every time I come across them. But we'll see. I'm not going to completely rule out contrast just yet. Just know that it is very likely I will not go back to that game again. All right. 51 minutes. I feel like I have said enough in this video. I'm so glad that I didn't tag on my anniversary idea to this episode like I was originally going to. That's going to be its own thing. Probably a long video. Not this long, but it is probably going to be roughly 20 to 30 minutes, if not longer. We will see. So uh, look forward to that, I guess. It, it should be interesting, I, I would hope, to some of you guys. So thank you all so very much for watching. I hope you all enjoyed this episode very, very much, and I will see you all in the next one.